today with uh, Da Wei Chen from Boston College, and he's going to talk on modelized spaces of curves and Teichmuller dynamics. Thank you. I want to thank Eduardo for invitation and thanks for coming for an early morning talk. So I'll start from introducing the so-called translation surfaces. I'll give you two definitions. They are equivalent. The first one, the translation surface is just a topological surface with a finite set of points called sigma satisfying the following condition. The first, so away from sigma, so there exists an atlas of charts mapping to the standard Euclidean plane, the complex plane C, and the transition functions for these charts, they are all given by translation. In other words, if two charts overlap, then the coordinates, they differ by some constant. Okay. So secondly, what happens to those special points in the set sigma? For each special point P, so it starts off under this, you view this thing as the standard Euclidean plane. So it has a Euclidean matrix, right? So under this Euclidean matrix, if you go around the point P, and you can measure the total angle at P, it has to be an integer multiple of two pi. And in this case, we see that those special point P, they are set of points. And if this integer multiple of is K times two pi, so the total angle at that point P is two pi times K. And let me show you some picture to illustrate the idea. So more precisely, so let's take a look at the special point P. So it is homeomorphic to K disks, or if you decompose each whole disk into two half disks, they are glued this way, asymmetrically, asymmetrically along the, the radius slate. So for instance, here A1 is identified with that A1 by translation, because they are parallel vectors. And uh, A2 glues with that A2, A3 glues with that A3, and also for the Bs. And for those people who know branch covers, locally this looks like uh, like a like, like, uh, unification of order K, K disks, or K plus one disks mapping to the uh, standard disk in the Euclidean plane. So once you glue this uh, half disk together to form a global view of this special point P, so you can see the following example. So this is a special case. So six pi is three times two pi. So in this case, k equal to three, you have six half disks, that is three whole disks. If you glue as what I showed you in the previous slide, the global picture will be that. So this center point, this black point, is a point P. And total angle, because now we use six di half disks, the total angle is six pi. And we call it a monkey saddle for the reason. Because if you think about it, it looks like there are one, two, three, three branches, right? So what is the difference between a monkey and a human being? The monkey has a tail. So it can sit on it more comfortably. And please read the overhead sentence to make sure you protect monkeys. So another definition which might work better for algebraic geometers. So equivalently, a translation surface is nothing but a closed Riemann surface along with a holomorphic one form, so that's it. So holomorphic one form is also called a building differential in the literature. So what are the special points in sigma? So they correspond to exactly the zeros of this one form omega. And secondly, if P is a zero of omega of one shell the M, then the angle I mentioned before at P is given by two pi times M plus one. So M plus one is that integer multiple. And why are these two definitions are equivalent? So let's take one direction. Start from a translation surface, and let's read off a holomorphic one form. Let me show you the following example. So this is a octagon, eight edges, enclosed the polygon, let's call it X. But these eight edges are decomposed into four pairs of parallel edges labeled by VI. So V1, the other, if we want, they are parallel, the same vector. And now you glue VI with VI under translation, parallel. And after this operation, so this octagon actually turns out to be a closed uh, topological surface, okay? And the genus, if you apply the topological OLA characteristic, I see, so there is like a one face and four edges, 
And after identification, all the eight vertices will become the same point if you check. So that is one vertex. So by the polar characteristic, you can read up the genus of the surface is two. And where is the one form? So, so first let's consider its complex structure. That's easy because its polygon lies on the Euclidean plane. You can just use the induced structure from the Euclidean plane. And so, so away from the special vertex P, so this surface has a transition structure in the first definition. Because say, if I take a point here, even on the edge, as, as long as it's not P, and this edge and the other one, they glue together. Because by tra translation, so exactly that means the coordinate change is given by Z prime equal to Z plus some constant. That is the difference when you move this vector to the other one. So they are satisfying this translation requirement in the first definition. And in this case, so although this coordinate Z is not globally defined because they, are, they differ by constant, if you differentiate, so you know, if you take the derivative, the constant goes away. So the derivative of the differential dz is well defined, at least away from p. But you can easily extend it as a globally defined one form on the entire Riemann surface X. So that is the one form omega. And apparently omega is nowhere zero away from p. And what happens at this special point p? And this is the octagon. And if you have learned high school geometry, you know the total angle from the octagon at the vertices are like um, six pi, right? So six pi is three times two pi. It's an integer module of two pi. That tells you omega locally should be the differential of z cube because three corresponds to the exponent three there for z. And if you differentiate, you just get up to a scalar z squared dz at p that tells you p has to be a double zero of omega. So in summary, so from this sort of like translation structure, this flat polygon, you read off of one form, omega, on this genus, genus two Riemann surface, and it has a double zero of order, uh, order two at the vertex P. So that's one direction. Starting from a translation surface, you can read off of one form, essentially by taking the derivative of this chart. chart. So conversely, suppose you give me a holomorphic one form, and how do I recover the translation structure? Well, you know, what is the inverse procedure of taking derivative? You integrate, right? So suppose let's take a one form omega. So this symbol omega zero just means the vanishing locus. So omega vanishes at P1 up to Pn, and the vanishing orders are these integers mi. And if you integrate omega, that exactly gives you the, the charge you want in the first definition. But you know, when you take integration, antiderivative they differ by a constant. So antiderivatives are not unique, right? They differ by constant. That exactly means the transition functions for this integration, the only ambiguity is measured by translation. So this chart gives you the chart you want in the first definition. What happens at those special points P? Well, so we know locally how omega looks like at Pi because that is a one order Mi zero. So that means after choosing suitable coordinate, so locally omega has to be d of z m plus one, that gives you z to the m. Well, that at least tells you if you have m plus one for the exponent of z, for each z that corresponding to one, like, like this in, in the Euclidean plane, you have m i plus one, many of them. The total angle at p is exactly m plus one times two pi. That is the integer multiple of two pi. So that is the other direction. So in summary, in this case, you just starting from this one form omega, you can get this transition surface with n special points, that is a set sigma, and each special point has total angle m plus one times two pi. So I gave you a quick proof of the equivalence between the two definitions. You can pick whatever you want. Maybe for some of you, you want like, um, you want to use holomorphic one form, that's okay. But if you are more into the geometric side, you can use this transition surface. So they are equivalent. So here are some more examples. So this is the beginning case for genus one, or complex one-dimensional torus. So there, uh, holomorphic one form, as long as not identically zero, is nowhere vanishing. So that means you will not see any special point. The sigma is empty. 
That's exactly the picture everybody knows, right? You've drawn a plane parallelogram and glue the two parallel edges, A, A, B, B, be enclosed into a flat torus. That's very simple. And conversely, if you give me this picture coming from a uh, torus, then you can read off a one-four. So this is a slightly more complex example. Suppose I have a genus two human surface with two simple zeros. And so this picture is a decagon, 10 edges, but decomposed into five pairs from A to E. If you glue them, every pair on the translation, you can check you get a genus two surface as well. However, now you have two special points. So the red ones and blue ones, they do not mess up. So after gluing, so they, they become like two distinct points on the Riemann surface. And their angles for each is only four pi. And that gives you the two times two pi and two minus one is one, that gives you a simple view. And uh, everything is consistent with, for instance, the degree of the canonical bundle or the degree of the vanishing order of uh, one form on the genus, genus two Riemann surface. Okay, before I move on, any questions? Let's put everything into a family. So it's more interesting to study these transition surfaces with similar structure in a family. So that's called the strata of polymorphic manforms. So, well, I'd like to fix the number and multiplicity of zeros of a one form. So that is, I take a partition of 2g minus 2 because that is the total vanishing order of a holomorphic one form, the degree of the conical bundle. So I consider the following subset. Parameterizing a Riemann surface of genus G along with a one form omega having this type of zeros, so n zeros with one order fixed. So, so far I defined it as a set. And it is called the strata of holomorphic one forms with signature given by this fixed partition of 2G minus 2. And if you put all of these strata by taking arbitrary partition and put them all together, that forms a very familiar object to you, the so-called Hodge bundle of all holomorphic one forms over all possible genus G Riemann surfaces standing over the modular space of genus G curves over MG. So it's a Rand G-vector bundle because on the genus G surface, the space of holomorphic one forms is G-dimensional. So the union of them actually is just the Hodge bundle. So in other words, this, this gives you the stratification of the Hodge bundle according to the zero type of the one form. And so this H mu, this stratum, is not only a set, it has a nice geometric structure given by the following so-called period coordinates. So I take a point in this stratum. So let me take a relative basis of H1 of this punctured surface or marked surface, marked as N zeros. So this relative H1, so the absolute H1 has two G basis. It's relative to the n additional mark point, so you would add another n minus one basis corresponding to the path connecting this mark point to one of them. So this is the picture. So these paths are the relative basis for this homology. So from 2g plus one to 2g plus n minus one. So this n minus one additional relative basis. The others are the standard absolute basis for the homology. And if you integrate the given one form omega along this relative period basis, these are called relative periods. And um, they actually give you a local coordinate system for this stratum HM. The reason is roughly because in the, following, in the previous picture I showed you, this polygon picture, and the edges, these exactly correspond to the integration of omega along this uh, basis gamma. And if you want to describe a local coordinates for this modular space, so that amounts to describing how they deform, right? But when they deform, that exactly means you change the complex length of these edges, vi. That means you are changing this period. So they give you the one-one correspondence. If you change it here, then certainly it preserves the number of edges, preserves vertices, and the gluing pattern, you will still end up with in the same stratum. And in particular, how many bases do we have? We have 2g plus n minus 1. That is the rank of H, the relative h1. That tells you 
this plot um, has complex dimension 2G plus and minus one and it's smooth. And for example, if you take the general partition one, 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 that means you take a general one form on the Riemann surface with all simple zero, and you would expect, according to the formula I told you, the total dimension of this guy is 4G minus three. That is correct, because that's equal to the dimension of the Hodge bundle, because this one is an open dense subject of the Hodge bundle. They ought to have the same dimension. And let me just put a remark. This is not my focus today. Although it is smooth, however, it might be disconnected. Surprising. However, further, you can only have up to, at most, three connected components. So usually it's connected, but some special signature mu, this guy might break into up to three connected components. And if this happens, these additional components corresponding to actual structure given by the hyperlytic and spin structures. If you are interested, I can tell you later, but not now. Anyway, so Conceive and Zorich declassified all connect components for all strata. So it's an amazing result almost 10 years ago. Okay, questions? So in my talk title, I mentioned something related to dynamics. So let me get into that part. So there is a special group action on this Hodge bundle, or more specifically on the strata HMU, called the GL2 action. So let's take uh, one form in this Hodge bundle. So GL2 is just a matrix, two by two, real. And I put positive discriminant, just make sure you get a connected subgroup. And you take A to be a, such a matrix. So how does this action work on HMU? Well, you present this holomorphic one form as the corresponding plane polygon. And you just take this two by two matrix acting on the Euclidean plane <coughs> by changing the corresponding edges. Right, this two by two matrix, this alpha action. Well, you read off another polygon of different slightly, maybe squeeze a little bit, extend it longer. However, again, so this action preserves the topological information, the number of edges and how they glue together and the number of multi uh, vertices. So this action certainly preserves this discrete information of omega, that is, it acts on each stratum H mu. And this acts- Do you need pairs of parallel edges? Say that again? You don't need pairs of parallel edges? No, this A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, yeah, they are parallel edges. This, because they are parallel, so the resulting thing, A is two by two remains to be parallel, mm -hmm. right? So it is not changed, right? So this action is called technical dynamics. More questions? I already mentioned that. So let's take a look at an example, starting from genus one. That's easy. You're just changing the shape of your parallelogram. You get all possible gene invariant in this case for genus one. That's not, not interesting. So for higher genus, it's more interesting. So one central question in this field is to study the orbits of this tachymeter dynamics. So in general, if you give me a general point in the strata, usually the orbit is ergodic, goes around the strata, and you take the closure, you get the whole strata. However, if you give me a special one form, sometimes a CL2 orbit closure might give you a proper subset. It's not the whole strata, so it cannot be ergodic in this case. So I mentioned, so clarifying this orbit closures is a central question in the study of tachymeter dynamics. And uh, there is a recent fantastic result done by asking Madhahani and Mohammadi two years ago. They proved the following statement. So you should review this as a structure theorem for orbit closures. What they did is that for any such orbit closure, although we don't know how to calculate them, they actually know they have good geometric structures. They are so-called linear manifold in the strata. In other words, if you view the stratum given by the pure coordinates as a local vector space, then those orbit closures, they are always locally sort of a linear subspace. So linear in the sense that they are cut out by linear equations using these periods with real coefficients. And very soon after this work, a student of asking, uh, Simeon Philip, he showed that actually you can strengthen the result. This R coefficient can be made into algebraic numbers, so they are all defined over Q bar for all these orbit closures. So there are some kind of secret 
or the magic nature going on. So anyway, so let me just also comment in case you don't know, this asking major Mazahani Mohammadi's result is one of the major contributions of Mazahani field metal work. So I want to specialize to the um, like most special orbit closures. So we keep talking about these actions and what would be the most special orbit closure. So what can you expect? So let me remind you, so I have been using the two terms, surfaces and curves. For me, most times they are the same, the Riemann surfaces and complex orbit curves. So please bear with me. So the hot bundle stands over the modular space of GNC curves, and there is a forgetful map that's forgetting the one form, that's this vex bundle mapping to the base, so remembering the uh, Riemann surface X only. Suppose you are in an extremely special situation, you take this GL2 orbit closure and project down to the modular space MG. And if the image turns out to form an algebraic curve, in that case, if it happens, we just call it a technical curve. So here, curve really means a complex one dimensional, okay? And equivalently, I only want to mention this equivalent definition as a remark. I don't know much about it, but it exists. So equivalently, you can describe tag mirror curve as a local isometry from another complex curve mapping to MG, where MG is equipped with this Kobayashi or equivalent to tag mirror matrix. So tag mirror curves have some kind of special differential geometric behavior, the sort of a complex geodesic under the Kobayashi metric on MG. And moreover, they are defined I mentioned over Q bars, in particular, they do not deform their rigid curves. No, they usually... No, they usually are not rational, rather not. Yeah, I mean, basically it's facts. No, I mean, I'm not saying it's a linear space. I mean, the theorem says it's locally a linear manifold linear in the sense that it's cut out locally by linear equation on the pure coordinates. You only know it's like locally cut out by these pure coordinates with like a, some algebraic number as coefficients. How would you conclude that they are like uh, rational? Are they linear spaces or linear spaces? I mean locally linear, globally not. All the coordinates I provide you are only local. The pure coordinates are not global coordinates on the strata. It's only locally defined, when you change the coordinates, even on the strata, the, change, the transition matrix are given by this GL matrix associated to the choice of your relative basis of H1 and with Z coefficients. This is only a local coordinate. So everything I said about this linear structure and the pure coordinates are local. And Tegmiro curve rather, they come from mapping from upper half plane, the Pankari disk, mapping to MG uh, isometrically, the rather not rational. Sorry, I didn't catch you. Yeah. No, this has, has they have been proved. Yeah. Yeah. By MacMuller, I did not put it MacMuller and MacMuller. Yeah. So you actually, you raise a good point. Here, rigidity, I, if you want to go into detail, really means this map as a map from the Pankari disk mapping to MG. In the stacky sense, you cannot deform the map, but the image could be different. Okay, so some more examples. So first, uh, do this technical curve exist in the first place? Like if it, they didn't exist, there would be meaningless to study. So luckily they do exist. Uh, let me present you one nice construction. So I take Again, fix the zero type mu, okay? I take a special branch cover from a gene G surface to the torus E, satisfying the following condition. The degree of the cover is D. And the fix the genus of the current curve to be G, and E, let's take it to be the standard square torus. And I require pi has only one branch point, okay? If you think the torus as a ellipse curve, you take the mark point to be a branch point a unique branch point at Q over uh, in E. And over this branch point Q, so pi has exactly n ramification points denoted by P, 
and each piece has ramification order mi. That means the ramification divider associated with this map is exactly sigma mi pi. So this is a setting for you to consider such branch covers. And how does it relate to our story? Well, you take dz on the standard square towers, right? That is well defined. You pull it back via this branch cover. And applying Riemann Hurwitz to the setting of this branch cover, exactly because this sigma MIPI is the ramification divider, uh, you know the zero type of omega, omega is given by this ramification divider. That tells you the pullback differential belongs to the strata you want. Okay? And such special <laughs> covering surface along with the pullback one form, they have a name. They are called square tiled surfaces, or if you speak Japanese, they are called origami. Why is it? Well, because they are covered by squares. So I told you, you take a standard torus, say this one by one unit square E, and this uh, branch point Q is the vertex there. And say this is a Example of five to one cover, so D equals five, you have one, two, three, four, five, five squares covering this uh, domain surface, and you still glue the parallel edges, A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D. And you can check after gluing, this actually gives you a degree five genus two branch cover with a unique ramification point of order two in the left hand side of the picture labeled by this blue point. If you think about it, this surface, we have seen it before in the talk, only the shape Differs. That is the first example I showed you, this octagon. Only here, the shape of this octagon changes. That means you get a special holomorphic one form. The genus is still two. And with a double zero, that is this blue point. All right, so we have concluded this resulting pullback one form belongs to this stratum. So genus two with a double zero is two. Moreover, if you apply this GL2 action on this pullback differential, so the left hand side picture is the original one I showed you here. But if you apply GL2, that really means you can change the shape of this torus first under this matrix. For instance, the right hand side, you change it to another parallelogram, but you just use this new parallelogram as your building block to cover, to construct this branch cover. To put it differently, you can just change the shape of this covering curve accordingly. So they are consistent, exchangeable, these two actions. That tell, tells you, so if you consider all possible such covers, that gives you a special complex one-dimensional Hurwitz space, parameterizing all such covers over all possible elliptic curves. So here, if I change the shape of the square, then you wouldn't get a standard torus, you get another J invariant. You take all of them into account, and there's only complex one-dimensional moduli for, for elliptic curves. You get a one-dimensional Hurwitz space parameterizing such covers. And you know, Hurwitz space are algebraic. So in this way, you just construct it, a special technical curve. It's invariant under this GL2, and this orbit projection given by the Hurwitz space projection, which is algebraic in the first place. And so this construction gives you a special technical curve by using this special branch cover. They have a special name. And uh, in particular, if you change the degree of the branch cover, you actually can obtain infinite many technical curves. So bear in mind, so we are considering branch covers of degree D to an elliptic curve. So if you plug in Riemann Hurwitz, there's no constraint to the degree of the branch cover. So two times the genus of the curve minus two is zero, that kills D. So you can raise D to infinity, to, to infinity if you want. You get infinite many technical curves. So they have a special name called, in this case, those technical curves generated by these branch covers are called arithmetic technical curves. So they are essentially similar to this genus one case, because it comes from this construction by branch cover of genus one curve. But there do exist technical curves of other type, not generated by square tile surfaces. And it's not easy to classify technical curves in general. So there was a result by Kurt McMillan and Cartel independently around this time. They only classify technical curves in genus two. And in general, a complete classification is still missing for higher general. Okay, so I finished first half of the talk, so any questions? So can you just, you look at the images of those orbits, right? And uh, in some cases they're not algebraic, right? Or they're always algebraic? If you take the closure, then it will be algebraic. If not, no. This is uh, like this map. 
from the upper half plane to mg, for instance, that is the orbit projection is sort of only holomorphic in nature. Yeah, it could go agogically if you don't take the code. And you can project it down to mg, right? You still lose some information. You lose some information, but not much. Yeah. So what happens above? Is it algebraic now, or? No, I mean, up, up there is, I mentioned one result by, maybe not yet, um, I could sort of mention, so if you take a general point upstairs, it still goes agogically. Yeah, so then you project because the Hodge bundle dominates MG. If you project, it still goes about it. Sorry. Yeah. So only if you take the closure. But when you take the closure, there are two meanings. You could take the closure inside MG by allowing the zeros to specialize together, but the curve is meant to be smooth. Further, you can even let the curve degenerate. You run into stable forms. I'll mention this maybe at the very end of the talk. Yeah. More questions? Okay, so well, so if something about inner geometry, just let's get into that as well. I want to mention one counting problem called Vigovich constants. So it's related to the behavior of geodesics, just real lines, with respect to the flat metric induced by the one form. In particular, they are related to the so-called billiards in polygons. You can see the following picture is a L-shaped pool table. Because if you study billiards, the billiard hits one edge so the reflex, right? But on the other hand, you can unfold <laughs> this L shape into the, the plane and study the geometry associated to the uh, one form defining this L shaped table. So people actually do this. Anyway, so let me mention what would be this Vigovich constant. There are like sort of like different uh, settings, all similar but different. So let me mention one quick, like naive example. So first. So a saddle connection is just a real line connecting two zeros of omega. So I, let me remind you, these saddle points are just a fancy name for zeros of omega, zeros of the one point. Now you consider a line connecting them under the line means that the line under the Euclidean metric. And now we let count those saddle connections with bounded lengths. For example, let's start from genus one. So genus one, let's view it as an elliptic curve. I have a mark point. So this small unit where sitting in the first quadrant is a standard torus. If I unfold it, develop into the whole plane, this vertex sort of becomes all lattice point in the plane, right? And in this case, a standard connection is just a line connecting any bullet point to the center, to the origin, right? And what we mean by bounded length, suppose the length has, is at most L, well, the way to count is very easy. You draw a circle of radius L. It only counts the number of lattice points within this circle. Right? I mean, when L large enough, well, at least you can easily count asymptotic behavior of such connections, say, connecting this point to that point, or the number of such points in this circle of radius L. That has asymptotic growth given by pi L squared if you count this direction. Right? That is the area of this, this, this disk. And in particular, let me remark that it, all, it has a quadratic growth, L squared. In this case, you take the leading term, leading coefficient pi, so then this leading term gives you the corresponding Zygovich constant in this context if you want to count set of connections with bounded length. So this is an easy example in this one. Well, so let me mention a different uh, counting problem, related but slightly different, called area Zygovich constant. So the meaning why we count this will become clear later in the talk. So, so let me remind you, I mentioned this several times, a geodesic is just a line under the flat metric. And a geodesic is called regular if it does not go through a zero of omega. So that means it does not contain any zero of omega. Let's move a closed regular geodesic up and down in the parallel direction a little bit until on both ends it hits the special point, that is zero of omega, then you stop. And then if you look at the, this, this process, the moving this regular geodesic up and down, and then the union of such geodesic in a family, they actually give you a so-called cylinder, I'll show you a picture later, CYL, whose boundary circles are, uh, boundary circles contain the special point, then you stop. So here's the picture. So what I meant is the following. So let's take this square tile surface again, although it works for any flat surface, this one is easier to understand. So because, so if you look at upper small, unit square, 
So along the horizontal direction, if you take a middle line, you can move up and down until you hit the bullet point. Then you stop. So that upper, like one by one, unit square gives you a horizontal cylinder. Has modulus given by the width, w equal to one, the height is one. When you take a longer closed geodesic, because these edges are identified together, move it up and down, you feel a different cylinder, which is longer, right? The length or the width is four, and the height is one. So if you identify the height for both, actually on the right hand of the picture, you do get two cylinders. That's what I meant. And the thing is, in the middle, if you go around cylinder, they do not contain uh, zeros of omega, only on the two top and bottom circles, they hit the zeros of omega, and you stop. You get like finite cylinder, finite area cylinder. And uh, so I always use W to denote the width, H, the height for the six cylinders. And obviously the area of such a cylinder is given by their product. And the things, let's do the same game. We count such cylinders with bounded uh, width or bounded length. So for each such cylinder on a given flat surface X, you consider such objects. You just sum up the area altogether and average down by the average of the the area of the flat surface, so you get a number called n, depending on the bounded width of the cylinder that is L. And now you let L go to infinity and look at the asymptotic behavior. And Vich first proved it, and asking major elaborate on it, they show that for any such orbit closure, they see orbit closure O, there always exists a constant denoted by this little c, satisfying the following asymptotic behavior, that is, you take this number, depending on L. It actually has a quadratic growth. So if you push them down by L square and let L go to infinity, and you normalize by pi over three, this is for some normalized factors, and you get a, actually limit converges to some number C, and this is a generic behavior for every flat surface, sorry, not for every, but a generic flat surface contains this orbit closure. Yeah, if you take a generic one, and you do this, and you get the same constant. And in this case, because we sum up area, so this number C, for the rest part of the talk, I'll always refer to this number C as the area big of each constant, sometimes as the escape area, so this big of each constant coming from this guy. However, if you take a different orbit closure, then the values might change. So they say it depends on the orbit closure, but does not depend on which generic point you take from the orbit closure. And luckily, if you focus on like those tech mirror curves coming from the branch cover construction, there is a combinatorial way to compute this number. So it's very much related to the Hoyt's counting problem. You take this number n to be the number of branch covers over a fixed torus. So that is a standard Hoyt number. And uh, you take a refined counting. So over this finding many like non-isomorphic branch covers, you take all of them, and for each one, you enumerate along one fixed direction, say the horizontal direction, you sum up the height over width, that is called the modulus of cylinder, sum up for all such cylinders containing in this finding many branch covers, and you do this double sum, you get another refined Hurwitz number counting denoted by this M. These two numbers, when genus, and let me give you one example, so again, so for this example, you have two cylinders. The one um, on top has height one, width one, you sum, so it contributes one over one. So for the bottom one, it's easy, one over four. So this is how it contributes. We just need to enumerate this for, N, for all branch covers in this uh, Hurwitz space. And then for tech mirror curve generated by these branch covers, so actually you can quickly see that this Bigovich number is nothing but the ratio of m over n. n is the first number, is sort of like you average by the number of, or the volume of the technical curve. So why is this called area Bigovich constant? Well, because this h over w, this special weight we use to sum up in ab, you can rewrite it as h times w, that is the area, divided by w square. So remember, when we count the asymptotic behavior, it has a quadratic growth. This W measures this, this sort of the, the, the weight or the length of the cylinder. So it shows up on the denominator, so the numerator is the area. Anyway, so I mentioned for low degree genus. So you can actually write down, like using monodromy, 
of a branch cover, you can write down like uh, how many non-isomorphic branch covers are there. So that gives you n. For each one, you can further directly can compute this refined Hoist number m. So for small d and g, you can do it. But when d and g go to infinity, you know, so usually this Hoist number counting is a highly non-trivial combinatorial representation theory problem, usually related to quasi-module forms and many other things. So Eskin and Okunkov, they analyzed the asymptotics of this easier Hoist number n. Why is it easier, actually? It's not so easy. They took uh, like a 50, 60 page in even Schumann to compute as an application the volume of the structure of polymorphic one form. See? So it gave you some ge ge geometric information for the global geometry of the strata. And if you want to count the other number m for d and g large, so let's see. So it's harder. And uh, we started doing this with Martin Mueller and Dagi, but still is a work in progress. I don't know when we will finish. But that's also not my focus today. Okay, now let's get to something maybe more familiar to you. So I want to talk about the geometry of compactified module spaces. Okay, so MG bar is a standard delimum for commodification of MG. And the boundary, well, consists of <laughs> stable nodal curves, right? The boundaries are conventional one. And it further decomposes into a union of irreducible boundary divisors depending on the topological type of those nodal curves. So for instance, if you take the index i to be positive, then a general point delta i contains parameterized nodal curve of the following type. We have two components of genus i, g minus i, gluing together at a node. I apologize for drawing a real picture again, but this is a, <laughs> a complex curve, okay? And for delta zero, you take a smooth genus g minus one curve and take two points and pinch them together. You get a general point delta zero. And if you go deeper into the strata, this boundary divider, they can intersect. For instance, this guy, if you look at the left-hand side node, is of type delta zero. The right hand side node is of type delta i. So it belongs to the intersection of both. <laughs> well, I mean, I did not say it only belongs to this, right? And um, my claim is still correct. Oh. Okay, so thanks for a comment. So the Hodge bundle I described earlier, actually you can extend it to the rank G bundle over the entire module space, even over nodal curves. So what is the fiber of H over a nodal curve? Well, you can think of if you have an algebraic background, so that is a section of the dual Lyman bundle. If you are like an analytic background, then that space or the fiber over a nodal curve is a so-called space of rational stable one forms where it has at worst simple poles as a node where the residues of simple poles sum up to be zero as two branches of a node. So they're equivalent. So I have a vex bundle over the entire module space. So I can take the first turn class to be lambda. And also suppose now you give me a complex one dimensional family parameterizing stable genus G curves. So there is an important index called slope denoted by S, given by the ratio of the degree of the boundary divider restrict to B, divided by the degree of the lambda class restrict to B. So this delta and lambda, they are lambda bundle classes or divider classes, they have a degree when you restrict to a one-dimensional family. So this S is a number. I suppose this is a family B. So you have a family of, say, smooth curves, and there are some special fibers given by nodal curves. And the numerator delta degree on B just roughly measure the number of nodes you count with multiplicity. The denominator, it's harder to state precisely, but roughly speaking, it measures the variation of complex structure in this family. In other words, it tells you if this degree lambda is big, then this family is rather like a highly non-trivial. Okay, so we mentioned like two numbers, the Zygovich number and the slope. They are defined in different contexts, but indeed they're the relation between them. So let's again fix this partition mu and uh, consider the following number only depending on mu. You take this partition and uh, you get this number denoted by kappa mu. 
and uh, carbon mu only depends on mu, so just some constant. And then, so about five years ago, I proved a result, a formula between the two numbers. It's very simple. The slope is equal to 12 times the zero rich divided by the zero rich plus this carbon. In other words, if you know one of the two numbers, S and C, you automatically know the other. So what goes on into the proof? I mean, let me just mention some upshots. So we have this formula, right? I want to link these two numbers together. At, at, at least let me tell you why they are related. So the first upshot, so this like crazy mysterious kappa mu comes from the calculation related to the Manfred kappa class, okay, if you know what it is. And then suppose we start from this cylinder picture, right? This is a cylinder. And <laughs> so roughly speaking, if you track the cylinder behavior along a tachymeter curve to the boundary of the modulus space. So the modulus, the height over width of the cylinder, will exactly give you the contribution of this tachymeter curve to the intersection with the boundary. At least that is one correlation between the two numbers. So finally, you have to do some, some calculations. We have this divisor class relation on the modulus space. Lambda equals kappa, that is Manfred kappa class, plus delta boundary divisor divided by 12. So this 12 also shows up in the preceding slide. And you plug in and do the calculation and you got the formula. Okay, so I think I started late, so I will borrow another maybe five minutes. Um, I don't have much to tell, but let me speed up a little bit, so please fasten your safety belt. So a side remark. So if you do dynamics, so far you might question, so my talk is not really related to dynamics. So a side remark is actually there are some more dynamical invariants coming into play. They are called Lea Puma exponents. And I won't give you the general definition, but I, because many of you know this better than I do, so let me just quickly mention what they are. So now you take a special subgroup, this diagonal subgroup sitting inside this GL2. It's a one parameter subgroup by this index T, right? So actually this defines by the same action, the so-called Tachmuller geodesic flow on the Hodge bundle over any orbit closure. And once you have a geodesic flow on the Hodge bundle, Hodge bundle has a like, sort of flat connection, you can study the so-called Lea Apunum exponent. The Hodge bundle is of rank G, so there are exactly G non-negative Lea Apunum exponent. And roughly speaking, there are eigenvalues of some matrix measuring the monodromy behavior of the Hodge bundle along this geodesic flow. That's all I can tell you about Lea Apunum exponent. And then there's another fantastic result proved two years ago by Atkin, Kofsky, and Zorich. They show the relation between the sum of this Lea Apunum exponent, not individual one, only the sum, and this Lea Rich constant. They determine each other for any orbit closure, not only for tachymeter curves. So it's very deep. And as a corollary, at least if you restrict to the case of tachymeter curves, then we got any one of the three numbers, the slope, the Zika Rich number, and the sum of Lea Apunum exponent, any one of the three, determine the other two. Okay. Questions? Please. Say it again. So first, so, so the relation between the slope and the which number, so that is the formula I, I told you. And for the sum of the opponents and the which number, there is an explicit formula in the EKJ paper, basically L equal to the Zikovich number plus kappa, where kappa is also that kappa I told you. So it's not, so maybe one last thing I'll say about this Lyapunic exponent that this lambda, the sum, really comes from the first chain class, that lambda class of the Hodge bundle. So things are related. Okay, finally I will just mention one last application out of this. So I call it the conceived and Zorich conjecture. Well, so about 10 years ago, so you know, I told you if the degree and the genus are small, you can write down some like concrete examples of like tachymeric curves coming from this branch cover construction. And you can enumerate the behavior of those dyna dynamical quantities, or those first numbers. So you run this computer experiment, so you ob observe the following interesting phenomenon. This is a low genus behavior. I'll tell you how low the genus have to be. But in any case, they observed for many of the strata in low genus, if you take one strata, and they found all type mirror curves they can construct in the same strata, actually all of their Zikovich numbers are the same. Because originally, 
we only do this for each tag mirror curve or each orbit closure. But I told you, for every stratum, it contains infinite many tag mirror curves yeah, by this branch cover construction. There's no a priori reason except they all have the same like uh, invariant. There are like an infinite many different orbit closures. So they made a further conjectural list based on this computer program. So from genus two, so two G minus two only has two partitions, one, one, and two. So they all have this, this behavior. For genus three, almost every strata has this behavior except the most general one. So see here, I'm missing this H1111, the general strata. That one does not behave well from this perspective. And in genus four, so roughly I have half of the possible partitions of 2G minus two. In genus five, I have several isolated cases. So this index odd and type, they are corresponding to the disconnected behavior I mentioned earlier, but let's ignore it. And then the phenomenon stops for a larger general, except for those hybrid structures which are easier to study. Okay, so this is their conjectural list. And uh, along with my collaborator Martin Mueller, about like uh, three years ago, we proved it. And uh, let me state it again. So that means for each strata in this list, and uh, we proved for all type mirror curves in such a strata, they have the same Zigovich number, and uh, accordingly, then they also have the same sum of Lyapunov exponents. So people are more interested in the sum of Lyapunov exponents, but anyway, these numbers are all equivalent. So if you know one is invariant, all the others are also invariant. So let me just use the last five minutes to give you the proof of the case H31 genus three. Let me think out this data. The method is the same. You will get a flavor how this works. In genus three, let me take this data H31. That is, one forms on a genus three surface with two zeros. One is a triple zero, the other one is a simple zero. So first, you may observe, if you take a smooth Riemann surface of genus three with such a one form, then this Riemann surface X cannot be hyperliptic. Otherwise, this has to be two, two, or four due to the hyperlip evolution. You cannot have like three, one. That breaks the symmetry of the hyperlip curve. So this is good. So that sort of indicates you should focus on the locus of hyperlip curves. Then, well, one, one other thing that, so, so far the first line only works for a smooth curve. But then if you track this curve x along the parameter family given by tag mirror curves to the boundary of the module space, actually you can extend this property to the boundary of any tag mirror curve in this data. In other words, the tag mirror curve actually is disjoint from the closure of the locus of hybrid curves inside the module space M3, M3 bound. And then let's just take the closure of the locus of hybrid curves denoted by height. <coughs> and luckily this gives you a divider, complex dimension one inside M3 bar, and you can compute its divider class represented using the standard uh, generator of the rational Picard group of M3 bar, that is the lambda class and the two boundary classes. That we know. Okay, then the next, so I already said, so the tag mirror curve in this strata, they are disjoint from this hyperlip component, a hyperlip locus, let's denote a tag mirror curve by T, and T and hype, their intersection number is zero. They are physically away from each other. They do not intersect. And moreover, so let's go back. So here, they also, the boundary coefficients are not uh, the same. If they were the same, we would be in a good shape because then we can read out the slope given by the ratio of lambda and delta. But they are not the same. But luckily, you can show that the mirror curves in general never meet any higher boundary divider. This is essentially due to the following topological fact. You have a cylinder of this, and you shrink the core curve to a node along the tag mirror curve, this resulting node is always non-separating because the core curve as a class in H1 is not a zero class. You cannot get a separating node. Otherwise, it would be a zero class in H1. So this node is always of type delta zero. So in other words, in the class of hype, you can ignore any higher boundary divider. Just keep delta zero and lambda. That's enough for our purpose. Now you know what I'm going to do. So we have this zero intersection. We plug in by the definition of the slope, that is the degree of delta, restricts the tag mirror curve divided by the degree of the lambda. Well, that is exactly this coefficient of lambda in this class, right, nine. So we read off the slope of the tag mirror curve is equal to nine. And this calculation is independent of the choice of tag mirror curve in the strata. I pick an arbitrary one. That tells us 
all the mirror curve is squared out, they have the same slope equals nine. And plug in the zig of each formula and slope that tells you all the zig of each constant and the sum of the upper exponents, they are all the same for all the mirror curve in this strata. And in general, the same strategy works. We just need to find another, for some other strata, we just need to find another divisor in the modulus the MD bar. Sometimes you have to go to the modulus space with mark points and show that by some geometric argument, this divisor D is destroyed with technical curve in a given strata. Then use the class of this divider and read up slope, and that will determine the zig of each constant. So that is a proof. And later on, so E and Zo, they give another very interesting proof of conceiving those conjectures. Their method is rather different. They use the so called harder near second field tuition of the hot bond over a technical curve. And there's another parallel story. If you know this kind of translation surface well, you might have been aware of the so-called half left translation surface coming from the quadratic differentials. You can do basically everything similar. So along with Martin Mueller, they proved a similar non-variant result for tech mirror curves in loginess, but in the strut of quadratic differentials. I mean, as you can tell, the whole techniques, at least an important part, really light on understanding the boundary behavior so for this application of tech mirror curve. But in general, you can ask, so what is the boundary behavior if you take an arbitrary, like GR to orbit closure? Why the boundary behavior really means extended to MG bar or MGN bar? So there is more need, I think, along this direction to study degenerations of flat surfaces or abelian differentials. So as an advertisement, I just posted a paper on the archive last night you can check out today. Thank you.